Okay, and I think that we should get started so we can stay right on time and have the maximum amount of time for our conversation today. So I am going to turn it over to Luann Smolin, who is going to offer some introductory remarks for us today. Um, Luann, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I am an ORCH donor and a national board member, and I welcome you to this ORT in Conversation webinar. I'm involved in ORC because it's proven to me that it's a sustainable organization with a long-standing history of helping students to not only survive the tests of time, but to thrive. We are certainly at a time of being tested and ORT is positioned to help many through these difficult times. These are challenging times for all of us around the globe. I've spoken to many people who believe as I do that this is a time for a reset. It's a time to reflect on the ways of living that we may no longer find sustainable. It's a time to rethink how we want to live. And it's a time to act in ways that can positively impact those around us. One viable way to reflect, rethink, and to act is to engage in dialogue with those who bring forth multiple perspectives, and I believe that ORT is uniquely suited to facilitate these conversations. ORT has a global presence, it's a leader in education, and through its actions, it's making an impact, changing the lives of its students and teachers, and I've seen this firsthand. Through this series, ORT will bring those who represent a variety of perspectives to the table, all in ways that will help us engage, rethink, and act during these challenging times. We really welcome all of your participation and I look forward to joining you on this entire ORT in Conversation series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luann. Um, I'm sure you can all tell, even from those remarks, what a really special board member Luann is, and I appreciate your contributions to this series and the others on the committee who are helping to shape this program. Um, and welcome everyone to ORT in Conversation. This is the second webinar in our new series to address issues important to you and to ORT. We're bringing together educators, nonprofit leaders, professionals, and other experts and thought leaders to share insights and consider how we can improve people's lives and preserve Jewish life by providing access to education. Or ensures that those in underserved communities have the opportunity to succeed and don't fall behind due to life circumstances, where they were born, economic challenges, family struggles, and more. We provide educational programs and services that inspire students and prepare them for 21st century careers by focusing on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. These programs give students marketable skills so they can compete in today's technologically advanced global economy. Today, we're addressing education technology with a panel of experts from Israel in the innovation, education, legal, and nonprofit sectors to discuss how ed tech can help bridge the divide between those in underserved communities and those in wealthier communities. This divide is not new and ed tech is not new, but our environment and our circumstances have certainly changed and everyone is looking at ed tech through a new lens. And to address these topics today, I'm really delighted to welcome our panelists, Avi Warshawski, CEO at Mindset, an ed tech innovation center, which brings together entrepreneurs, educators, researchers to develop innovative, groundbreaking educational technology in Israel and beyond. Lehi Feldman, legal and strategic consultant in the areas of education, innovation, and technology. She's consulting with organizations on how to bring ed tech initiatives into being. Dr. Moshe Liba, Chief Informal Education Officer at World Ort Kadima Mada, bringing the world of STEM to, the, to Israel's periphery through innovative after school programs and much more. Um, and moderating our conversation today, I'm really delighted to have Laura Golinski, who's also a friend and former colleague, and today the Vice President of Philanthropic Partnerships at Startup Nation Central, 
which is involved in many projects that impact Israel's periphery and high tech and innovation sectors. I'm going to let her tell you a little bit more about um, her involvement in this whole area. Um, but just before I turn it over, um, I just want to remind everyone to please submit any questions you have for the panel throughout the discussion in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll be monitoring that throughout and I'm going to come back in about half an hour or so and bring some of your questions to the panelists. So um, please, please share your thoughts and comments. And without further ado, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to this conversation and so glad that you're all on to, um, to participate with us today. So, Laura. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's really a great pleasure to be here. I remember my, my grandmother talking to me about work. So it's like, I know that it's been in our family for very many years and, and it's been something that's been deep, you know, close to our heart. So yes, I am the Vice President of Philanthropic Partnerships at Startup Nation Central, which is an interesting and kind of unique nonprofit in Israel. Um, we won't get in deeply into what we do, but I think one of the um, very interesting things and lucky things for me, and of course in this um, context, is that most of the work that we do, or all of the work that we do, is really derived or, or generated by research. So we have a very large research team. And about um, three years ago, we kind of did a research project that was funded by the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation on the status of um, human capital for in the high-tech sector in Israel. And we were shocked when we found out that there was such a dearth of um, talent in Israel because how could we be the startup nation on the one hand and have a real lack of human capital to be filling key positions in the high-tech industry? Um, and what the other thing that was interesting to us was that, A, who were the people who were not taking part in the high-tech industry, which were clearly the people that we had to bring in. And those are some of those underrepresented populations that we'll probably talk about in the, um, further on in this pr um, presentation. But also that there had been programs developed for the under, these underrepresented populations, be they the ultra-Orthodox population, the Arab population, or even women, 50% or 50 plus percent of our population in Israel. And those, those programs weren't moving the needle. And that we felt that at this point, using the connections that um, Startup Nation has within the Israeli tech ecosystem, that we had to actually be active in starting to create programs that brought the ecosystem and the underrepresented populations together and taught the exact skills that people need to enter into this. So I feel like I'm coming to this panel in a place where I've, I've personally learned a lot about um, ed tech and about the um, Israeli um, kind of technological ecosystem and um, want to, you know, Kind of delve into it with my colleagues here who are super um, knowledgeable in this area. So I thought we'd start out with you, Lihi, um, and kind of give us um, a thought about what is EdTech, it, you know, what is this beast, and also has there been any change in the way that we view EdTech based on um, the, the before and after Corona scenario? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much. I'm actually very glad to be here for very many reasons. First, a distinguished panel, and second, I think this is actually a very exciting time to be involved in this whole field. Personally, I come from a governmental background in my past where big systems try to move very slowly, and I was involved in the whole technology legislation scene. And today I'm more involved in the bottom up, hands on, how to get the system to develop from the bottom and the, the initial initiatives. Um, so it's an interesting standing point for me to look at. Um, and I thought I'd like to give in, let's see if this is going to work, just a few introductions, maybe a snapshot of what I see when we look at, at the market today or at the Israeli community today. Um, hold on, and I would like to introduce this. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay. So the first, I think, thing that connects back to what Laura was mentioning first point is that our point of reference is a very diversified yet very centralized complex school system which includes the Jewish sector as one sector which includes the secular and the Haredi and the religious and each one of these 
vis-a-vis -vis technology and vis-a-vis -vis modern advance, it's going to be a whole new world, which we're going to have to understand how that works and how that relates. Then we have the Arab population of 500,000 students, the Bedouin and the Jews built in within the system itself from its initial starting point. We have different aspects and different processes, different ways to look at what technology is, how technology belongs within the scene, what the school is and what the ed tech scene can contain. And what do we refer to when we do refer to the ed tech scene? And to go back maybe to we think pre-COVID-19, which we know what pre is, I don't think we know what after is because we're still in the middle of it. Um, but I think we'd like to take a look at the concept of using technology to facilitate learning and to create a more engaging and a more personalized experience. I think that as a very broad experience, uh, or as a very broad definition, we can try to take a look at that entire concept. And if we look at the past decade or so, at what's been going on in the different scenes, our startup nation has been very active. There's, there has been, on one end, very many industry involvement. There has been even governmental creation of a digital box of tools a toolbox that can be accessed by schools. There have been initiatives that provide uh, software and hardware providing devices to different ends of the periphery. There have been municipalities that created extracurricular programs and informal education, introducing different ends of creativity and using technology in order to create different angles that can advance education. There have been incubators, there have been accelerators, there have been learning management systems which were offered to the schools. And then the question is, okay, that sounds amazing. And it sounds like we should be way ahead of where we actually are. Um, but I think as we started to understand, this isn't the case. Um, and if you wanna take a look, we have a whole box of tools just waiting to burst forward. And I'm sure my colleagues can each give examples of where these things are developed and how they are introduced into different ends of the environment. However, if you wanna take another more maybe amusing look at it, um, 2,000 years ago, we were stuck in the desert in order to move forward. And now the question is, what can we take to move forward in order to introduce this technology and this change of a paradigm into the school system that the startup nation with all its potential can really be, um, be moving forward. Um, and then what happened came March and we, a, crisis, a crisis came. Um, we still haven't completely introduced the concept of EdTech into schools, but now we have to create what is called or what has been termed pandemic pedagogy or emergency remote teaching, which isn't the new EdTech world we'd like, but some kind of ad hoc kind of solution to address different aspects. Which aspects do we have to deal with? There are infrastructure questions, there are content issues, there are pedagogy issues. Each of these had to be addressed um, within, within this emerging crisis. Let me just say two words as another snapshot of what's going on, and then we can delve into each one of them, I think. Um, but as an example, um, a serious issue that has to be addressed is how does internet reach the periphery? So as the crisis emerged, the, the Ministry of Communications allowed overriding regulation and providing instant shortwave bandwidth to the periphery. It's a great solution, but it doesn't solve the concept of how do we make the most and how do we really change um, the, the potential within the different schools. Um, as far as content, what kinds of content can be addressed through EdTech? So the government provided daily schedules and broadcast classes and there were videos on Zoom that really overwhelmed the system. All of these were provided, but that is not, when we say EdTech, that is not exactly what we mean. We mean a whole, a whole world that goes way beyond the Zoom translation or the copy paste of different, um, of different ways of thought and different ways of using tools of the 21st century to move us forward. And I think each of my colleagues from their perspectives can maybe introduce their aspect of how this connects to where pedagogy is and should be today. Thanks, Lee, that was super. So Avi, you've been working in this area for you'll tell us exactly how long. And I know that um, you have given this a lot of thought. So I know that people are asking me as a representative of Startup Nation Central now, they're kind of, kind of coming to us and saying, oh my gosh, Israel did a great job in so many areas of um, getting through the pandemic. That doesn't mean that we're not going into the second wave, we probably are, but that we really were, were quite able to control it and we had a lot of technologies that helped us. 
I'm not sure that we, we, we as, as um, residents of the country and as parents feel that, um, that we actually handled this so well. So maybe give us a little bit of background. I know that Israel has been working, not just you, but Israel has been working for years to kind of create an infrastructure for teaching times of crisis. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that and tell us what you think worked and what the lessons that learned that had to be changed for next time or moving on. Well, actually, as, as was mentioned before, the field of edtech is, is uh, pretty mature. Like I think about five decades that we have educational technology and, and Israel is not very different from most of the, let's say, uh, Western countries, uh, or let's say the European countries to be more accurate in the sense that we, we adopted a lots of solutions that were uh, mainly amplifiers of the existing system. Like we, we never used technology really to uh, create a new, new landscape or new alternatives. And, and uh, when we compare uh, the effect of technology on any other domain, uh, uh, nothing like that happened in education. Like if, if I was a graphic designer for for instance, and I was trained uh, 30 years ago and, and fell asleep, uh, probably I, I won't be able to go back to work now when I'm waking up because the whole profession was, was really redefined. If I'm a teacher that fell asleep 30 years ago, I can scratch a little bit and enter to, 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 to the classroom and all the technological aspects are really, uh, until this crisis, were in the periphery of what I'm doing and mainly amplifying the existing world. And, uh, and, and I think in this sense, nothing uh, dramatic happened. Uh, and it's not just an Israeli phenomenon. I think it's, it's uh, globally almost uh, the, the, the landscape. There are some exceptions, but the, those exceptions are usually, uh, are not really scaling. Uh, the system in a way uh, is rejecting uh, in many cases the, the opportunity to, to, to change itself through technology. Uh, having said that, I think there was some, some progress about a decade ago in Israel in the sense of uh, working on the infrastructure uh, and the government was very active uh, in, in uh, creating infrastructure in periphery. But I live in Yerucham in the Negev and I think the infrastructure that my kids are enjoying is, is much better than, than your kids in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, is, is really impressive. On the other hand, uh, we don't see the, this kind of infrastructure in the Bedouin community, for instance, or in other underserved uh, communities that uh, really, uh, we, we face it very dramatically in this crisis, but, uh, but even beforehand it was uh, the case. So you're talking about what I, what I understand that you're saying, you're saying that the way that is the Israeli educational system looked at this up until now was basically taking the building blocks that we had and putting them on a different platform rather than rethinking the whole way that education works given modern tools that we have. And exactly. Moshe, I guess this okay. And I guess, Moshe, this is like a really interesting time to ask you as a teacher or, or a, um, a teacher of teachers, how did, the, how did like the teachers deal with this? Were they prepared? Did they have the tools that they needed? And were they familiar on the most part with the different kinds of technology that Avi has been so um, central in developing for the educational system? Well, um, I agree with Avi, by the way, that uh, when we're talking about edutech, by the way, around the world and in, and in Israel, and I don't know if the participants know the summer model by Robin uh, Puandatore, who talked about four levels of simulation of educational technology in, in the educational system. So when he presented this model, he talked about substitution and, and augmentation uh, that means enhancement of the learning uh, and teaching processes. And he talked about the modification and redefinition of the processes. So that's talking about the transformation. I think that Avi is right. We, by the way, around the world and in Israel also, when we talk about uh, the Israeli educational system, K to 12, and also the academic one, 
we are talking more about the enhancement part of the model, which are the two lower, as, two lower levels or the lower aspect of uh, um, using educational technology inside the educational system. And in that manner, I think that um, the pandemic showed us that the teachers, most of the teachers are, are not really ready to, um, to, move, to move on and use the transformation um, level. They don't know how to transform, how to redefine the education when they're moving it from the real classroom to the virtual one. By the way, I'm not, you're right when you presented that we um, moved to Zoom pedagogy, but Zoom pedagogy is not something bad, by the way. It's one mod. It's a synchronous mode of teaching and learning and assessing. Uh, there's a lot of other modes. Um, the best one to use today is the hybrid one, which is a synchronous and asynchronous modes, and also face-to-face, -face, of course, which we couldn't use in the pandemic, um, and we know why. I think that uh, we did see that, uh, and the Ministry of Education especially saw that the educate that uh, professional development of teachers. We talk. We are talking about it for the last decade that we need to do more professional development for teachers using edtech in the in their classrooms. By the way, remotely and uh, face to face. But now we actually see that they what they did is substitute the real classroom to the virtual one. They didn't really transform the, the pedagogy into uh, online pedagogy, which we are talking about when we talk about education and technology as a lever for better, techno better pedagogy, of course. So, so I think that's what we learned. I think that uh, the teachers were excited at the beginning when we moved from face-to-face -to, -face to, to online. They were excited. After a month or so, the, they started to see the challenges, so there started to be a frustration around uh, the teachers. The Minister of Education didn't do well in that, you know, we can, we can look back and reflect on what the, the ministry did. And they did, as, um, as my other colleague says, they, they did a top-down approach. They went online, they did um, a asynchronous uh, broadcasting, they did um, an agenda for every day, they didn't let the teachers do what they really know how to do. Um, and they, that's something I think that, uh, you know, in rest, retrospective, they should have thought about doing a more uh, bottom-up approach. Interesting. And Avi, are you seeing a lot more um, demand or or interest in the different um, kind of uh, portals that you are in charge of because from the side of the educational ministry or teachers, et cetera, because of the understanding that this might be a situation that we're going to be in for an extended period of time? Yes, actually, uh, we see uh, a huge uh, change in many dimensions. First of all, usage, uh, and it's not just us. Uh, since we're working with startups uh, in Israel and outside Israel, I can say that the, the statistics that everyone is sharing is roughly about uh, four times higher traffic than, than uh, they used to see in websites. Many of them are, and especially in K-12, uh, I think is the most uh, radical change that we see. And also in our local environment, our headquarters is based in the Negev Desert in, in, in Yerucham, as I mentioned. And, uh, and for many years, we used to work with the early adopters. And uh, in a way, it was like uh, an approach that we were trying to convince them to, to, to take a look at, at those uh, aspects. And some of them were crazy enough to test it. And now uh, the whole uh, um, relationship changed. Like, the demand, the demand is very high and it's, it's, we're working with everyone. Like, uh, there is a very um, common and, and well-known uh, um, scheme of uh, model of, of Rogers that describes uh, the curve of uh, division between different users when adopting a, a innovation. And early adopters are, let's say, about 15% of the, of the population of the users. And uh, 
now I think we are facing the the late majority even like uh, it's about 80 percent or so of teachers that understand that uh, in, in order to survive in this environment they must be really uh, hands-on with, with those solutions I'd like to come make another comment oh. if I may um, I think that uh, uh, Dr. Leva works with a with the community, is privileged enough to work with a community of teachers that are more sophisticated in one end. And I think that on the other end, the fact that the government tried, as a big system, tried to address the majority of teachers, which had no idea what a Google Classroom is or how to upload. We asked a teacher to upload a document and we said, can you bring your files? Can you show me where your files are? And she said, just a minute. And she brought us her physical binder with her files. So that teacher needed a big boost in order to move forward and understand what needed a big catalyst. And as the pendulum swings back and forth, I think that they went to one end and they tried to spoon feed the content. I think everyone understands that that is not a good solution. It was an emergency solution. But looking forward, I think that the system was shaken up as a big system, not only the more sophisticated ends of it, but the hardcore system is looking for ways to introduce a more intelligent a more balanced and a more sophisticated way of the hybrid learning, which is of course not 100% Zoom, which it's clear to everyone that it doesn't work at any age, definitely not for the lower ages. Um, and there is some kind of movement, I think now, um, which is thanks to this, to this pandemic, we'll see where it goes moving forward and how fast the government can pick itself up and allow the liberty that the teachers need and the, and the training that is needed in order to move forward. But it's somewhere I think in this Thank you. That's really an important point. And so I, I'm thinking when you're saying that, that, you know, there were also certain challenges and I'm thinking, you know, Avi's been so involved in creating um, technology that requires the household to have technology or the students to have technology as well as the teachers, like you're saying, Lee. And I, I mean, and you're saying that in where you live in the Negev, you're very, you know, well set up. I know that in my house, we have five kids and I, I I feel like we're very techy. We had, you know, good internet, but we actually didn't have five computers that could be used at the same time. I was working, my husband was working, and you know, I thought our our wide band was not so wide anymore when seven of us were on Zoom. So, did you feel like the kids were set up for this too? No, no, I don't think so. I think. Uh... I, when I'm saying set up, I, I think uh, it, it's pre-COVID. I think the COVID really put us in a situation that we could, uh, in a very large scale, could not really cope with. And and, and the, the kind of challenges you are describing are, of course, much more uh, challenging in uh, unserved populations. And, uh, and uh, imagine a house with seven kids that they have one device probably and, uh, and no internet connection and, and, uh, and there are lots of houses like this uh, in the periphery and, and this div really expand the, the division between different population in Israel. Yeah, I think that that's really kind of one of those, um, those kind of dividing points. So Moshe, I'm sure you saw that, you know, very much in the, in the different populations that you work with in, in the schools, like Lee's talking about on one hand, like the more sophisticated teachers versus the less sophisticated teachers, which is just a reality in, in any country, but also in Israel. But this is also the haves and have nots. And do you live in the center or not in the center, except where Avi lives, right? <laughs> good, good setup. But, um, you know, yeah. And also like, you know, I know that we've been dealing a lot with um, the ultra-Orthodox community and with there's also, um, issues that are just uh, policy issues about having internet, not having internet, et cetera. Maybe you could give us a little more information on that. So, so Avi, Avi is completely right, by the way, that there's a huge difference between the periphery and the center uh, of Israel. And that's, by the way, also around the world, you know, the difference between the, the big cities or the much more uh, higher socioeconomic status cities and the low ones. Um, we saw that uh, we work a lot in the in northern Israel and also the Negev, and we saw that and there is unfortunately a natural gap, um, a digital divide that actually still exists uh, between the center and the, the north and uh, south of Israel. Uh, relates to infrastructure, relates to a uh, manpower, pedagogical manpower, relates to a lot of aspects of education. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but when we talk about infrastructure, like Avi mentioned, we saw that in houses of four, even three or four kids, uh, there is one device. There is, of course, as we said, uh, uh, a full agenda of teaching and learning from morning till noon. And the main complaints were we have only one computer. That's what we got. So we tried, by the way, in, in our schools and our um, our centers to provide, you know, because we closed uh, most of the centers and the, the schools closed, of course. Uh, so we tried to give out the computers to the students at home. That was kind of a first aid solution uh, that lasted, you know, part of it, of course, not, we don't have a lot, a lot to give computers to every child. So that was part of the solution. But uh, by the way, in the ultra-Orthodox or the Haredi uh, population, which don't use the internet, we try to use phones and give them uh, recorded lessons, uh, even uh, give out um, um, leaflets, give out uh, kits, which we bought and uh, just, you know, told people, you know, send SMSs and messages come to the center in a specific time and date to pick up your kids in order to, to work with the kids. So there and books and you know that's what we could do in uh, in the um, terms that we had unfortunately. Uh, yeah that's really interesting. There were several I think there were so, several you, oh, I was just gonna add there were several initiatives following that which were just they're heartwarming. It's not a national solution, but I think there were industry, as even children who are collecting computers and fixing them and handing them out to people who were more needy. We saw a lot of that going on. Companies who are willing to donate and to collect and even either whether it be old computers or new ones that can be purchased. It was kind of a sense because it was a pandemic that these things were going on. It's not a national solution, but it kind of is an indication of where, where solutions can start coming from if we focus on them, if it becomes a priority. So that's been. really interesting, and I definitely think that one of the strong aspects of Israel and maybe also international Jewry is being able to mobilize in times of crisis. And I know that there were a lot of things like that, and in, in, I know in the U.S. as well. Um, but you wrote this really interesting article, like at, pretty much at the beginning when when we sort of began lockdown, and you mentioned some of the things that really weren't working, and then some of this either suggestions or surprising things that were working. So I thought maybe you could just give us like two highlights of something that we were all surprised didn't work so well and some things, you know, besides just our internal mobilization, but things that, you know, we're all of a sudden hopefully going to see in our educational system now. Um, I, I, okay, what I refer to as different aspects, but I think that, again, the lawyer in me is going to look at the barriers and we'll try to see what of those can be removed um, and what tools we have. Um, there's a whole list of reasons and explanations why um, th this change is so slow to come within a, within a system and within a government. Um, one aspect we can look at is this centralized aspect of the, of the system, the, the centralized assessment, the, the standardization of the tests, the central system, which is all governed by very strict regulations about what each student needs to be matriculated when they graduate high school. And that sets a very clear standard that all the schools are focused on and the whole pedagogy is oriented towards the final test. So starting in a certain grade, we can't introduce any creative, any, almost any, it's harder to introduce the creative tools because the teachers as well as the students are being tested for the bottom line and there's nothing else in the middle. And it's not just an Israeli problem, but if you look at Finland, for example, they've removed their standardized test and they're one of the leading countries in the world as far as education system. So that's something that can be learned. They had a standardized system and they removed it over the years. Um, so the standardized and the centralization. Um, the other thing which I think is crucial, and again, it's starting and it's out there, but the whole concept of teacher training, um, which you see the differences between the periphery and the, and the central schools, even within the central locations. If we speak within my kids' schools in Jerusalem and I say, okay, so who are your teachers who are, who are dedicated to the, to the IT within the school? And they don't really have anyone because they don't really need it because they did without it up to now. And I think that what this, what this crisis created was an understanding of the need um, that the teachers are be willing to cooperate. And now the system has to introduce that as far as training, as far as acknowledging the system, and as far as acknowledging the teachers, extra hours that need to be devoted 
to create this whole awareness and this whole change of culture to move it a notch forward from where everyone is up one step as far as openness to technology. And the technophobes, I think, have overcome a lot of their fears and are willing to move forward at this point, or at least so I hope. That's just two of the lists of the... Yeah. Okay. So, Barbara, I know you want to get on and ask some questions. I'm just going to ask Avi one more. And I was just thinking that when you were speaking, Lehi, how interesting it is that, in a way, the lockdown kind of unified center and periphery. So, yes, there are issues of, like, you know, how much infrastructure was built in a place and, like, you know, then if you have your computer your computers can work and do you have have nots in terms of how many computers you have in your house but all of a sudden maybe with with um, content like you have on your centers Avi it, it you know you didn't really you could the same teacher could be teaching in the center and in the periphery like it almost created a, an even playing field so I'm wondering if like the even playing field was also cross culture. So do you have uh, the, the same amount of content or, or for the Arab speaking population as you have for the Hebrew speaking population? Do you, did you have to do other languages like Russian for new immigrants? I, I'm just like kind of thinking what other things were there that were still not 100% balanced and were there different peripheries that kind of emerged? Well, I think in the, in the sense of the solutions that uh, we propose or, or others uh, players propose, I think there is a pretty much uh, diverse uh, solutions in all languages. Uh, I think there's more in Hebrew than in Arab, but there is pretty much uh, solutions also in Arabic. Uh, the problem is more a uh, cultural one, like uh, I think uh, in, the, in the pandemic, we saw it very strongly. Um, when, when kids from a, a very, let's say, strong and, and a sustainable house are staying at home and, and have to learn from home, uh, they have lots of solutions, maybe even sometime better than the ones they had in school. Like their parents are more accessible and they went through education and, and, uh, and, and they can find them uh, many paths to, to learning and also to can show them sort of a model for, for the way of being learner. When it's the opposite, when the, par the parents have no background in education, maybe they are very busy in surviving and answering other gaps, uh, the gap is getting wider. And, and I think the key is not the technology or the content, uh, the, both of those are really important and I make my living for many years from those, but I think the key is, is the same things that created the divide always and, and uh, now in those days it, uh, it's getting even wider and, and this is uh, like uh, your starting point and your role models and, and the environment you see around you and the people. I think it's, it's about people, not about technology and not about content. You're muted there, Laura. That's always the case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for all of this great conversation. And I do have some questions submitted from our audience. So I'm happy to, um, to bring a few of those to you. Um, one question, is there a movement within Israel for ongoing teacher training to build ed tech capabilities? Um, is training of new teachers different and evolving in this context? Well, I, I can answer some of it, and of course, I'm, I'm sure uh, Moshe has uh, 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 more perspectives. Um, I can highlight one one thing that we were involved in, and I find extremely effective, and it's um, a combination of uh, professional development and piloting, and uh, it's a program that brings together. Uh, teachers, educators, and entrepreneurs, and uh, the teachers are going through professional development, which is recognized by the government as, as their PD. Uh, and the core of this process is about testing new startups and uh, creating a dialogue with the entrepreneurs. And, and there are a few programs like this in Israel, and I, I find them extremely effective. First of all, because uh, the teachers in this situation are very active. They are not like uh, being instructed to, to download this file or to push this button, but really are part 
part of the development process. And second, because uh, uh, this feedback is, is, is crucial to create the right solutions. So the startups also uh, find it very extremely uh, um, relevant for what they do. And this dialogue is, is part of the keys uh, to create a, a new reality. Like, uh, you cannot really lean just on, on solutions without users that are uh, uh, implementing them. And, and you cannot expect uh, teachers to be early adopters without going through this kind of, of uh, professional development. I agree uh, with Avi, by the way. Uh, CT and, uh, and Avi has an amazing model of um, bringing together educators and startup, startup people to work together and uh, doing an amazing job. And of course, um, the several other models by the way that uh, work in professional development in israel israel the ministry of education has really a very good professional development model for teacher for teachers um we use today micro accreditation which means that the teachers can choose from different uh, subject and different uh, content matters and uh, different pedagogies that they can create their own path uh, we have hackathons and meetups where the teachers can get accredited uh, from the ministry for being part of those uh, events in order to be a, a part of um, creating the solution themselves or be a part of uh, the brainstorming towards the solutions. And then, of course, what Avi said, being uh, developing the solution with high tech people, without high tech people. Um, but um, I think that um, we have a lot of models. The main um, issue is that most of the teachers who are coming to do these professional development programs are the same early adopters, like Avi mentioned in the Rogers models, are the 15, 20%, and the others are very, very hard to, uh, to get on board. And I think, by the way, what the pandemic did is I think that, like Avi said, it moved a bit the, the curve and I think now that the teachers when they came face to face with the challenges they understand now that they need to learn how to utilize and these tools in order to have a better pedagogy. So staying on the the teacher training piece um, there was a question about um, what are some examples, specific examples of what teachers could be doing to redefine education online? You talked about, you know, whether the solutions up till now have not been transformative. It hasn't really transformed education. So I think this question is related to that. What, what can we be doing to actually redefine education and what can teachers be doing? Well, I think it's a very good question. Um, Again, I'm, I'm looking at, at our own experience. One of our uh, uh, activities is, is working with teacher entrepreneurs. And, and, uh, and, and I strongly believe in, in this uh, entrepreneurship that comes from the teachers themselves. And, and during the, the pandemic, we saw, we saw a lot of schools that uh, try to create their own solutions and, and really to, to shape the, the, the world of, of, the, of the kids and the teachers uh, or reshape it. Uh, but I think the key for all those uh, uh, examples were, first of all, this approach of being an entrepreneur yourself and, and, uh, and leaning on your own initiative. And, uh, and there is, a, really very interesting examples, a, a very wide range. I can give like a, two, two uh, different anchors that we met during the, the crisis. One, one school that uh, the principal wanted um, that, uh, that every teacher will have a, a phone call, not a, not a, a text uh, message with every student uh, every day and uh, in his classroom. And he wanted to, to make sure that this happens. So uh, he came to ask and ask uh, some technology that can support this kind of thing. And, and he implemented this in his school. We, we, we helped him to develop something very agile. 
And afterwards, I saw it uh, duplicated in, uh, in other schools very fast. Like uh, each school took and, and did like uh, its own uh, version, but it was a need that I could not really think about uh, myself. It's something that came from uh, the values and the way that he runs his school and uh, the, the standard that he puts. And, and uh, when he created this, uh, all of a sudden, many other principles that share the same kind of thinking so immediately the, the value that's needed. So this one was one example. Another example, a teacher that created the sort of offline cards that works on emotion. Uh, as, as we all know, all the aspects of social emotional learning became to be much more important uh, under this crisis. And, and th these cards were designed by the teacher uh, to, to, to cope with the situation. And, uh, and she, she uploaded it uh, to a PDF version, and all of a sudden it became be like a, a pandemic for itself. Like uh, teachers in other schools started to adopt the same thing and uh, and made it digital, and and uh, it was amazing to see the how strong uh, this entrepreneurial spirit of teachers can, can be and how effective it can be. And I think uh, the potential there is huge. I'd like to address the the other end of the spectrum. I think that entrepreneurial is is an amazing advantage whenever the teacher, for those teachers and those early adapters who do have it, um, I think that this, maybe the slower end or the slower adapters who had to deal with this, I think what they were missing and what they needed most at this point was a sense of community or a sense of collaboration in and among themselves. Teachers who didn't know how to deal and how to approach once something was introduced and once the school had to deal with a certain tool and there was a community that allowed them a little more flexibility than they were used to and a little more of taking their own responsibility and playing around with it, I think that can move forward into changing what they were used to doing and getting support from the system. If it doesn't come from within them, if they don't know what to call up a center and say, I have a great idea, what do I do with it? But how do I introduce audios, audiobooks into my class? How do I deal with it? How do I get this going within the system? How do I create some kind of project-based learning? Once you have some kind of communication going within the teachers and create those communities, I think a lot of that can help advance the slower end of the, of the teachers and that end of the education system. Uh, Baba, I'd like to add also, you, the question was, how can we redefine education? I think that, by the way, the first thing that uh, we need to do is um, think about or choose the pedagogical approach. I think that uh, what we saw in the pandemic was, uh, as I said, uh, substitution. Most of the teachers also, by the way, the early adapters, a lot of them, um, did the substitution means they took the face-to-face -face classroom and substituted for the virtual one. So it was kind of the same thing. And we understood, everybody understood it's not the same thing when you're going online on synchronous, uh, like Zoom, for example, and the other environments. It's not, it's not easy and it's not right to actually um, translate the physical one to the virtual one. And I think that uh, um, the first thing that we needed to in order to redefine education is to redefine the pedagogical approach. And we, we talk a lot about it. We talk, talk a lot about the 21st century skills, which is kind of, again, a, an old jargon, which more than 20 years. But uh, unfortunately, we talk a lot about it. There's a lot of progress, but again, not enough. Uh, Avi mentioned entrepreneurial skills, which are very important. And we saw, you know, we see the teachers that have entrepreneurial skills, the students they try to pass it along to the students and work with entrepreneurial pedagogy. Uh, there's a lot of others like uh, uh, Lee mentioned, project-based learning, PBL, or problem-based learning. Um, I can give you an example that we used during the pandemic. We used a lot of uh, gamification with coding. We, are, we are offered 15 students from, uh, uh, from Anier, which is a project that brings, uh, an old project that brings students from uh, the former Soviet Union and other countries to Israel uh, for the high school. So they stayed in Israel. They didn't have any solution. They couldn't go back home. The schools were out in Israel, so we had to take care of them and kind of give them something to do um, throughout the day. And we developed a virtual, a virtual reality classroom that teaches coding. So we 
gave them a, an instructor for 90 minutes a day, and they got, they got a project to work in groups throughout the day in a virtual reality environment. So again, it was one solution uh, to change, to try and change the pedagogy to give them more entrepreneurial skills and collaboration skills and uh, coding skills and the computer computational thinking and other skills that we're talking a lot about. You touch on a few things that came up in, in a few questions in different ways, but the idea that online really just isn't the same at the end of the day, I guess, no matter what the pedagogy is or how you're doing it, it's not the same as being together in person, especially for certain kinds of experiences and lessons. So two questions. One is about um, ideas and possible solutions um, to address or enhance social interactions among students. So that piece of their school life, um, you know, is not really replicated online. And another question similar, which is um, something like teaching science and the fact that you no longer have labs and lab opportunities for hands-on activities. Um, so what kinds of initiatives are making up for that aspect of, of learning science? So one is the social interaction and one is the hands-on learning, but um, two very specific examples of how being on a Zoom platform is not so conducive to those types of opportunities that students really need. Well, I, I can answer about the science labs. What, what we are offering and what we, I think um, a lot of um, educators are offering. Um, by the way, um, regarding the science, we have some science courses uh, that we developed and also Weizmann Institute developed uh, kind of a MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses or um, videos on how to uh, utilize home, your home closet or your um, under the sink um, um, stuff in order to use, to, to do science experiments or to buy things from the local grocery or supermarket to, uh, to have science experiments. So that's what we're using, very simple materials in order to, uh, to do science experiments. By the way, in, in classes also in Israel, and I know also in the US, to do elaborate science experiments, there are also a lack in, in that, when you're face-to-face -face even. Um, that's regarding to, to science. Regarding to technology, by the way, that's not a problem. Uh, using, for example, Arduino kits, which are, um, um, you can buy it for very cheap um, at home, at home and, uh, and use it online in Zoom or other, uh, other environments uh, collaboratively. You can hook it up to the computer and work together as a group, even from afar. No, you don't have to be face-to-face -face. Using, uh, using other kits of technology that use uh, utilizes code and um, and the other elements of coding. So that's regarding experiments and hands-on activities, for example, comics and animation and, and other fields of STEAM education can be utilized um, in online environments, in group settings, individual settings, together, by the way, um, with other kids online. You don't have to do it alone. I can uh, relate to the other question about uh, the kind of sense of community of, among kids. And uh, I think maybe we should rephrase this question because actually kids have very rich uh, life, uh, social lives online. They had it always and it's, uh, it hasn't changed uh, through the crisis, even get better, I guess, but through the social networks and gaming and so forth. But the real challenge is, is the, those kids uh, that uh, in a classroom could be, may, maybe their voice is not heard in the same way and, and, uh, and maybe they're not uh, as popular in those uh, other platforms. And in, in a moderated classroom, maybe the teacher is there to, to make sure that uh, their voice is heard and uh, that they get the right uh, attention and so forth. And, and, um, and when you are leaving it, just to the power of the of the market and, and the natural kind of uh, 
social interaction, it's, it's, it's a problem. And, and I think this is, this is a tough one. Uh, like, there are different ways to, to make sure that uh, the communication is done, but when you don't have the infrastructure of, of the classroom and the face-to-face -face interaction, it's very difficult to, to, to really bring uh, this kind of interaction to happen uh, in an artificial way. Uh, and because they have such a vivid online life, it's even tougher uh, in this situation. I think it's also, important, it's also important to remember that I don't think anyone assumes that this is the online is a complete replacement for what's going on in the real life. It can be changed. Capsules, or what we call them here, the different integrated units, that can be a better solution, which allows, as Avi said, the smaller groups, the groups that can go into schools and deal with each other and get up. It's a changing pedagogy. You can't have 40 kids in a class and expect to have amazing uh, emotional relationships. That's the situation today. That's where we come from. So maybe introducing the technology as a way of breaking up the classes or working into smaller units is actually an added benefit to where we used to be not so long ago. So that's something that the, once it's not a crisis felt emergency solution, but more of a thought out process, some kind of combination of all those tools allowing more flexibility and more one-on-one -on -one interactions is actually a better outcome than where we were before. That's something to look forward to. Okay. So I'm watching the time. We're suddenly down to our last few minutes. And actually, I want to ask Laura if she has anything to tie together here and thinking about what we're looking for um, next year in the fall as school opens, like, you know, if there's any thinking planning or any other just sort of final remarks um, on the subject to share with, with everyone. Well, I was just, first of all, so um, gratified to see that in the programs that we run, um, the ultra-Orthodox community led by their rabbis and religious leaders actually decided in some cases to um, embrace technology and bring it into their households. And I think that, you know, even though it's not everybody and not every single household, the fact that there was a deep understanding within different levels of our community that changes had to be made and that we couldn't wait around and make them over um, over a long period of time was just a remarkable um, adaptation and something that I personally felt very proud about. Um, I think the other thing that I just keep thinking about is exactly the, the question that I asked Avi and I think that you know it's, it's just an interesting one is that this possibly could be the way for us to start thinking about creating a more um, equal or equitable society for our children because really the talent is there, the thinking heads are there. Possibly this crisis brought it more to the front for us and we now just have to like really put our heads together with these wise people who are already involved in the educational system and figure out how we're going to make this good for, for all of our children. So that would be my final remark. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this really thoughtful conversation. Um, really interesting. And um, although you're all focused on this in Israel, I, I think we all know that these are similar issues happening really all over the world right now, certainly here in the United States similar digital divide, what are we going to do differently online, what is education going to look like. So we really appreciate your insights. Um, a few things that really stay with me are um, the idea of teachers as entrepreneurs, I think is, is fascinating, you know, where that, where that goes, what that means. And um, the idea that 80% of you said of teachers now are sort of much more hands-on with this technology and how it's going to look, you know, you, it's not going to be fall asleep this summer and wake up to the same old come September. So I think we'll all be watching to see how that how that looks. Um, and certainly in our our schools at World or at Kadima Mada throughout Israel and um, and all over the world, we're going to be doing our best to help them have access to these um, technologies and um, new ways of learning and help everyone get through, not just through this crazy time, but actually improve education, level the playing field longer term, bigger picture um, for, for students and children. 
So this has been really wonderful. It is one o'clock on the dot. So we are perfect. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this was the second webinar. I certainly hope the series is going to continue and that you'll join again. So stay tuned for, for the next opportunity to dig into another topic related to education and um, access to, um, to, to technology and, and all of these um, really valuable, meaningful um, subjects. So thanks everyone. Um, tomorrow, a quick plug. Um, Robert Singer, Chair of World Orts Board of Trustees, is going to be speaking at the Jerusalem Post Conference on COVID-19 and the Jewish world. His, his talk is at 1.40 p.m. Eastern time, I believe. You can just click on, I think, the J Post uh, website and see a full day of programs and activities. Um, he'll be speaking on Jewish education, so feel free to join if you can. And otherwise, wishing everyone a great week ahead. Thank you.